22. We are grateful for those that have joined us, and then we hope more people will join. Uh, on our agenda, we are going to just have a brief introduction uh, to be followed by the program for today, which is uh, wash water and uh, sanitation and hygiene um, program. And we are looking at the vision objectives and practices in the context of IPC to be taken by none other than Mrs. Niniola Williams. We will introduce her when we get to that. Uh, then to be followed with our friend from Cameroon, our next door neighbor, Mr. Juan Jacob Gokte, uh, to take us on the program in Cameroon, lessons and challenges, so we can pick and learn from him. Uh, then after that, subsequently, we'll have a case presentation, our spotlight session on improvement in IPC practices at the Alex Equipment Federal University Teaching Hospital of Abakaliki by Mr. Benson Algo. Then subsequently, at 3 o'clock, we have discussions, reactions, and then, uh, of course, from 3.20, we'll have our feedback, because we believe that feedback will make us Improve. 3.25, then we'll have announcements about the next session. I want to say welcome and please enjoy the session with us. Uh, so we're going straight into introduction. My name is Dr. Abibola Shewalde. I'm facilitating this session. And uh, with me here is uh, Lekon, our IT. Stroke IT, IT and admin support. And in the room, I have three other people um, Doris, Benjamin, and I. Dr. Suleiman from uh, Federal Medical Center, Utimeta. And of course, uh, I will ask you to get a little please introduce Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shidali so we we don't really have the speakers at the hall, but they are going to be uh they are presenting remotely by internet. Uh, but I know we have uh, we have our partner from India. Simran, do you want to introduce your team? Simran? Yes, hi, Dr. Sonde. Hi, everyone. So my name is Simran Agarwal, and I work at ECHO India as a project executive. And really happy to see you all, and have a nice session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, a few housekeeping before we go into the presentation uh, proper. Uh, please, can we name our devices? Uh, some of us will just use the phone numbers. We want to identify you by your name be able to talk to you so that we can interact properly. And I want to just implore us to please mute our mic when we're not talking so that we don't have background noise that will disrupt the presentation so that we all have the most of it. We welcome Mrs. Nini Ola Williams and I think Jacob, Jacob. And Jacob, our two presenters are online. Uh, we thank you very much for keeping to time. Um, I think that's about all for, uh, for housekeeping, but I just want to ask you, please, to note, as the presentation is going on, can you please note your comments, questions, so that at the end, we can come back and discuss and have a robust discussion, so we know the most of today. So the program today is water, sanitation, and hygiene, which is the foundation of infection prevention and control. So on that note, I think uh, we're done with introduction. I can see some few people on. I may not be able to mention everybody by name. Uh, welcome, Mrs. Omotai, or who I did from Abuja. I may not know where you you could check in from, but we'll talk to you, but we have Cameroon. Um, and of course, we don't know whether we're going to have people from South Africa, well, the more we are, the better. 
So on that note, uh, so that we don't take too much of your time, I think uh, I will now introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is the chief executive of the managing director of Dr. Stella Adadevo Head Trust. She's been on this uh, NSIC platform before. She holds a uh, BA in Cognitive Science and neuro, Neuroscience from the University of West Indies from yeah. USA. Uh, a certificate in social sector management from the Enterprise Development Center of Pan Atlantic University and a certificate of basic skills in IPC from College of Medicine, University of Lagos. Prior to heading the Dr. Stella Adadevo Health Foundation, she's worked in the US and in Nigeria, she works for MSH, which is Management Sciences for Health. So she's been involved in infectious disease control, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, name it, so she's very experienced. She's a very strong IPC uh, expert, and they're ready to share her knowledge. She's young, but she's well talented, she's intelligent. So I give to you my first presenter, Mrs. Niniola Williams. So I don't know, do you want to share your slide or do you want us to share your slide? Can you please share your slide, Nini? Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you, Dr. Shawande, for that wonderful introduction. Um, greeting to everyone from all over the world where you may be joining from. You're very welcome. Um, I'm happy to be back here again on the Echo platform. It's a very exciting one. And since the last time I was on, there have been so many very interesting topics. So I'm glad to be here today to share my perspectives on WASH. I'm going to try and make this a bit interactive. So please, if at any point you can't hear me, do let me know. I'll be monitoring the chat box as well as we move. So because of time, let's get started. Um, the topic today, as Dr. Shawande has already mentioned, is WASH in the context of IPC. So we're going to start by talking about, of course, the relationship between the two. We have to understand what is WASH, what is IPC, and how they are connected. Then we will talk a bit about the current state of WASH, the issues we have, some statistics, some challenges we're facing. And then we'll go into the specific WASH objectives and practices, again, in the context of IPC. So I want to start, like I said, by describing the relationship between the two. Um, I think it's important for us to establish that before we start talking about best practices and the way we should be doing things. But to talk about WASH and IPC, I'm going to start with an analogy. I'm going to make a comparison. So I'm going to take us away from the health sector now. We're going to go into something that is more about everyday life. So please just follow me. What is this? If you can post it in the chat box, those of you that can see the screen, um, please post in the chat box what this item on the screen is. It's not a trick question. Please just post what you see on the screen. Or if you like, you can also raise your hand and share what you believe you're looking at on your screen. So what is this item on the screen? Okay, laptop. Yes, correct. It's a straightforward question, right? It's not a trick question, but I will explain why I'm asking you to answer this question. It's a laptop. And what do we all use the laptop to do? So we have laptops, what do we use them to do? Let's have an answer from someone. God will. Okay. 
So we use the laptop sometimes for work, sometimes for personal, right? But we know that we have different uses for it. Read, research, exactly, good, exactly. So what is this item on the screen? We do use it for studies as well, yes, very good, for work, good. So what is this item on your screen now? For a lot of work, yes, we use the laptop for a lot of work, it's a work tool, beautiful. To receive information and send information, beautiful. Yeah, these are all correct. Those are reasons for using a laptop. So what is this item on the screen? A smartphone, okay, good. Okay, other comments on what we use a laptop to do, to store information, to search information, to work. Yep, very good. And yes, what is on your screen is a smartphone, mobile phone, phone, however you want to call it, it's a phone, okay. A smartphone, good, smartphone, very good. So the question I have for you are, what do these two things have in common? You have a laptop and a phone. What, what is in common between the two of them? What can you call both of them? That will be the same word or words that you can use to call them. Communication tools, beautiful, yep. That's a good one. What else can you say about these two items? What's a way you can describe them both together? We touch them often, yes, we do. We interact with them with our hands, very good. I can see your IPC brain is already ticking. <laughs> That's a good one. Electronic devices, good, I like that. So they are devices, communication tools, perfect. They're devices, good. What is this on your screen? If you know what this is. Office, what does that refer to? If you know the logos, if you look under the word, you may see something you recognize there. So this is a tool that we use maybe to make documents like Word documents, this PowerPoint you're seeing, it's this Microsoft Office that I use to make it, right? So it's a tool we use to make documents and to share documents, share information, communicate, and all of that. What about this? I think we all know this, right? What is this? We're all using it now. Ah, good, I'm seeing the answers. Microsoft Office, Microsoft Tools. Yeah, that's correct. So what is this? We're all using it. It's also a kind of communication tool, right? Something we use to share, to see each other, to meet, to engage, right? Free learning space, I love that. That's a beautiful one, yep. It's a free learning space. We don't pay for it. As long as we have it, we can access each other through it. And what they have in common is that both of them are tools that are loaded onto devices. You can use them on your phones, on your laptops, and all of that. So if you think about these things on your screen, and I'm going to connect this to Washington IPC, don't worry. If you think about these two things on your screen, there are two ways we can describe them. They work together. I'm sure we can understand that, right? If you have a laptop that doesn't have Zoom, you can't meet with anybody on that laptop. If you have a phone that doesn't have Zoom, you can make calls, you can use WhatsApp. But if the phone comes with nothing on it, the phone is just a device. They didn't load anything on it. There's no WhatsApp. There's no email on the phone. There's no Zoom. There's nothing, it's a useless device because you can't do anything except maybe even make calls, right? But then if you have a laptop that has no internet, no Microsoft, no Zoom, no browser, you can't do anything. You can't search, you can't read, you can't research, you can't create documents. It just becomes a device on its own. On the flip side, if somebody gives you Zoom on a flash drive, it's useless because you can't use Zoom except you have a device to load your Zoom onto. I know some of us may be using our laptops to connect to this meeting, but most of us are probably using our phones. So for Zoom to work, we need to have a phone or a laptop device. So they work together. If you have the laptop and phone alone, without the Zoom and the office, they're not effective. If you have the Zoom and the office without the laptop and the phone, they're not effective. And so you can categorize them like this. You can say that the software is the Zoom and the office, and the hardware is this phone and the laptop. And the reason is that the hardware is the physical 
the device. You can hold it. You can touch it. You can't touch Zoom. Zoom is a is a coded thing. It's it's it lives on a device. You can only access Zoom if it is on top of something, if it is inside a laptop or inside a phone. So you have hardware and you have software. And that is the concept we're going to use today to understand IPC and WASH. When it comes to IPC and WASH, WASH is the hardware and IPC is the software. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So I want us to just tie this into what I said about the phones and the laptops, right? You can't have, if you have just the hardware and only wash alone and nothing else, it's not going to be effective. But if all you have is IPC and you don't have the hardware, the wash behind it, it's also not going to be effective. So wash, let's define it. If we're talking about healthcare, because we know wash can exist in communities and other places, but in healthcare, wash is talking about providing water sanitation, waste management, hygiene, cleaning, infrastructure. The key word in this definition is the infrastructure and services. So it's the physical things. It's the tap, it's the pipe, it's the toilet, it's the sink, it's the septic tank, it's the soak away. It's the physical things that relate to the use of water sanitation and hygiene. The vision for WASH from WHO is to substantially improve health by safely managing the items that comprise WASH, that's water sanitation and hygiene. But IPC, on the other hand, is a practical and evidence-based approach to preventing infection. IPC is a practice. It's not a physical infrastructure the way WASH is, right? IPC is the behaviors and the practices. It's the things we do. It's our activities and actions. It's a bit more soft. You can't really hold it in your hand. You can teach someone how to do IPC, but it's not something that you can physically put into a room. There's no physical item that represents IPC the way you can have a physical item that represents WASH. So that is the relationship between WASH and IPC. WASH is the software, sorry, WASH is the hardware and IPC is the software. So IPC is not practical without WASH. You want to take IPC and you want to do an IPC program in your facility and improve hand hygiene by 30%. So that's an IPC program, improve hand hygiene by 30%. But you don't have a wash program that is providing the sink and the clean water and the waste water disposal for the, for the hand hygiene to be practiced. So without the physical infrastructure of the sink and the toilet and the clean water, you can't practice your IPC. So IPC is the software and WASH is the hardware. So without WASH, there's no IPC. And I've said what's on this slide already, so I'll just keep moving. Because if you have questions, you can always post in the chat box. So let me give you an example. IPC will tell you to practice routine environmental cleaning of the health facility, routine meaning daily, in fact, sometimes multiple times in a day, depending on which part of the facility. So if I want to clean the environment in the facility, but I don't have clean water, which is a wash problem, I can't practice that IPC practice. That, that cleaning in an IPC way cannot happen if I don't have access to clean water coming from somewhere in the facility. So you can see how they work together. So they overlap. WASH has its own things that are dedicated to WASH. IPC has its own things that are dedicated to IPC, but they have an overlap. And this is the area we're interested in today because this place is where we want to ensure we are practicing and doing the right things. They work together. IPC cannot stand alone without WASH. And if you build a sink and you have clean water, but nobody knows how to wash their hands properly, they've not been trained, they've not been taught, they don't understand IPC, that sink will go to waste. The same way, if you teach people how to wash their hands, but they have no sink or you know, infrastructure available to do it, they may not be able to. They can use sanitizer, of course, but we're talking now about water, water sanitation and hygiene. So let's talk about the state of wash quickly. How many people work in health facilities who have constant running water? Just raise your hand. Do you have or do you not have? I can't even see any hands raised. Most times when we ask this question, and we find that people don't really have access to clean running water like that. Um, it's not there, it's constant. Not that you buy it or you have a borehole and sometimes it dries up and all of those things, but 
constant running water is rare in some parts of the world. And we know that in terms of statistics, we have 1.5 billion people who have access to health facilities that do not have sanitation service. 896 million people have, are using health facilities that have no water. We have 25% of health facilities lacking basic water services, and one in five have no sanitation. One in six have no hand hygiene facilities, no soap, and no water in their toilets. So we can see that this becomes challenging when we're talking about infection control. If you don't have a sanitation system, you don't have clean water, you don't have you know, the basic things that we're talking about here, how can you stop the spread of infection? In Nigeria specifically, we are top three, unfortunately, in the world when it comes to people who live without access to safe water and sanitation. We are second in the world in open defecation. We know that in many of our communities, they're openly defecating because there's no access to toilets. Again, lack of sanitation system. So what are the basic wash principles? Let's get into it. We know that lack of wash, again, means that we cannot practice our IPC. So that means that we will have increased infection and illness. It also means that AMR, antimicrobial resistance, will increase. It means our environment will be contaminated. Our groundwater will be contaminated, which in many places is the main source of water for, for many health facilities and communities. So without wash strategies, policies, and support, these are some of the issues we will face. So let's break it down. Wash starts with the letter W for water. So what are the principles of water? I don't think we have time, but if you can just post in the chat the source of water in your health facility. There have been surveys done here in Nigeria to show that many health facilities don't have constant running water. They buy their water and even that purchasing of water is not consistent. Many times they run out. So, the idea of wash when it comes to water is that we should have clean running water, that's safe water available in the key locations where we need it in the health facility. We need an adequate quantity no, of water. No. Sorry? We need a constant um, access to water, whether it's purchased, like I said, or groundwater. We need... Um, it to be stored properly. Many times we have water that we don't store very well. Are we cleaning our tanks where we're storing the water? How are we treating the water that we're getting if we need to treat it? And then how are we dispensing it for the user? If it's a health worker or a patient who's going to use that water, is it in a bucket where they're going to take a bowl and stick their hand inside and contaminate it? Is it in a touch-free tap? Is it in a tap that can be elbow operated? How are we getting the water out from the source for use? Okay, I can see, yep, one facility has reported a borehole. Thank you for that. Um, so what do we use the safe, clean water for? We use it for hand hygiene, definitely, as a key preventive measure when it comes to infection control in the health facility. We also use it for cleaning and disinfection, laundry, sterilization, to drink. There's so many applications, and there's so many reasons why we need clean running water. The S in wash is for sanitation. And what is sanitation? Some people may answer this question in the chat box. Let us know what is the sanitation system you have in your own health facility. Now, adequate sanitation, what does that mean? It means that we have capacity to manage our waste water, our fecal sludge. What are we doing with it? Where is it coming from? The waste that's coming out of the toilets, the hand washing points, the cleaning areas, the laundry, um, where patients are bathing, the sluice room, where are we putting all of those things? Where are they ending up? Do we have an adequate sanitation system? And as we know, this is the application. It should look like this. We must have some kind of soak away septic system. There must be a way that we're collecting and treating, disposing of this kind of waste. So that's the W, A, and the S. The H in wash is for hygiene. And hygiene definitely overlaps with IPC. We're talking about personal hygiene. We're talking about the face, not touching your face. I'm sure everybody can remember when COVID first started, everybody was saying, don't touch your face, don't touch your face, because touching your face will bring any infection on your hand into your eyes, nose, and mouth. So protecting your mucous membranes. We have our normal hand hygiene, whether it's with sanitizer or with clean water and liquid soap. We have our respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette meaning that we don't just cough or sneeze into our hands. 
we use a disposable tissue and practice hand hygiene after, or we cough and sneeze into our inner elbow so that it doesn't end up contaminating the hands or the environment. These are part of the WASH principles which overlap with IPC. So why do we need WASH for IPC? I hope at this point in the presentation, you can answer this question. Um, the answer is simply because IPC is not practical without WASH. As I've said, how do you clean if you don't have access to clean water? You want to clean the environment. You want to mop the floor. You want to um, wash the bed railings or the drip stand, or you want to um, sterilize some equipment, or you want to manage your waste properly. How do you do any of those things if you don't have access to clean running water and sanitation systems in the facility, which is what WASH would provide? So for every aspect of IPC, and I've just listed a few of them on this slide, but for every aspect of IPC, WASH is important, it is crucial, it is essential. We cannot achieve IPC in our facilities without the WASH as the foundation is built upon. So this is on the combination of WASH and IPC and what it really looks like in real life. And this is from the DG of WHO, Dr. Tedros said, not only does the lack of wash services in healthcare facilities compromise patient safety and dignity, it also has the potential to exacerbate the spread of antimicrobial resistant infections and it undermines efforts to improve child and maternal health. Now, the reason this is very significant is because this is exactly what we're talking about now. The combination of WASH and IPC. Without WASH, infections will spread, AMR will increase, and preventable deaths will also increase. So on that note, I would like to say thank you all for the opportunity to share with you today, and I hand over to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Shikhe. Uh, no, sorry, Nini Ola, Mrs. Williams for giving us the basics, and I'm sure it's self-explanatory. Uh, we all know that water is life, and that personal hygiene is basic to uh, healthcare provision. Uh, and I hope we are noting down our points, our clarification or comments. And on that note, with that foundation that was intelligently presented uh, by Mrs. Williams, we now want to go on to the second presentation by our dear friend, the secretary to ICANN, the latest secretary to ICANN. ICANN stands for Infection Control African Network. Mr. Okwam Jacob Gote, who is a registered nurse. He has a bachelor degree and he has a master degree in nursing. He is a very reputable, reputable trainer. His special area of interest is infection prevention and control slash wash. And I would say not just in Cameroon, he's well known for this even in, um, in uh, Africa, because he's the, he's the way we talk about uh, wash, in Africa, in Africa, we, we refer to Jacob. He's generally known as Jacob. And when we say wash, he knows more about the other African countries. So I want to just hand over to Jacob to go on and tell us the status of wash in Cameroon so that we can learn the basis for our presentation and the implementation wherever we find ourselves. Over to you, Jacob. Um, thank you, Dr. Suwane. Um, it's a privilege for me to share on this platform. And uh, I want to thank you for giving me uh, uh, the opportunity. Um, I've uh, listened to uh, Williams twice in other platforms. And I want to say it was a privilege to be co-presenting with her uh, during this session. Uh, I came along with some few Cameroonians and uh, they are actually listening to us and it's an opportunity for them to also learn what is happening in Nigeria 
Um, I will be talking on the state of wash in Cameroon, and I want to share the results of a survey uh, that we did in 2020 and uh, in 2021. I hope you are seeing my screen. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, before uh, we begin, I know that Cameroon, sorry, Nigeria is a very strong football nation, uh, just like Cameroon. You know, in Cameroon, after religion, the second God that we have is football. And I know there are a few people that you we respect very much. And what really interested me here is that uh, this particular team that we have here is a team that um, performed more than 20, 25 to 30 years ago. But today, if you ask any child in Nigeria, as well as in Cameroon, there are some names that you will, they will feature very prominently. And one of the most common is JJ Okocha. I hope there is nobody on this platform who does not know him. Now, the question I'm asking, many years after he played football, his name still lives on. Now, why is it so? And how can we use football or any other sport to leverage on IPC watch? That is just a food for thought. Now, uh, let me begin with the introduction. Um, my co-presenter already has uh, talked about watch and so uh, I am not going to be repeating most of the things she has said. But the most important thing we need to note is that watch is actually the foundation of quality or a universal healthcare. And it is a determinant for the attainment of many health interventions, including uh, environmental cleaning and disinfection, antimicrobial stewardship, and most recently, uh, clean hospitals. And the, every health facility needs to have necessary and functional services to be able to provide essential and quality health care. But unfortunately, a lot of gaps still exist. We already had our core presenter, and so I will not be repeating the gaps. Now, why is WASH important? WASH is actually one of the core components of IPC, as illustrated by WC, WHO uh, in the core component uh, document. It is core component number eight, which is the built environment, uh, material, and equipment for IPC. And the wash is an appropriate environment, an appropriate environment, uh, wash services and material are, and equipment are essential for IPC and are the cornerstone for any IPC program that you might have, you can ever think about. And therefore, the built environment is import, important for patient dignity. Now, can you imagine a health facility where patients don't have a toilet? Just imagine a delivery taking place in a room without water. Now, what kind of delivery can that be? What kind of a health facility can you really think of that does not have water? I think if you have a health facility or a service area without water, you really cannot call it a health facility. Therefore, WASH is crucial for prevention of healthcare associated infection, antimicrobial resistance, epidemics like the most recent one that we have just seen, uh, COVID-19. Um, WASH is also fundamental for child survival uh, and education as well as universal health coverage. According to UNICEF, WASH contributes to livelihood, school attendance, dignity, and help to create a resilient community for children as well as adults. Now, if you imagine a community that does not have water, now children and women, especially a girl, girl child, they spend the whole day looking for water. And then sometimes they end up missing classes. And if they don't find water, they might end up going to class without bathing. And then when they are in class, they feel distracted because they will not feel comfortable. Therefore, providing uh, voice services is a human right. It is not something that we need to be arguing about it, or it's not a favor that we are doing to anybody. It's a human right, and we must ensure that every child everywhere grows up in an environment that is healthy and comfortable to that child. Then access to clean water, basic toilet, and good hygiene keeps children 
thriving and they give a, them a healthy start in life. Of course, we are losing a hundreds, hundreds of children every year as a result of lack of wash because of diarrhea diseases, which may lead to malnutrition and may complicate the whole process and oh, will end up losing children oh, even oh, before they are oh, Now, I always like to cite good examples. I found this under the Zambian IPC guidelines, and I think it's very important for us to note. Now, the guidelines state that a lack of appropriate wash services increases exposure of infections to patients and healthcare workers. Now, if they already have identified that wash is essential for patients and healthcare workers, therefore they will want to do everything possible to ensure that there is adequate wash in the health facility. I wish if all African countries have actually caught this vision. Now, I mentioned about gaps, and then my core uh, panelists already also hi highlighted some of them. But what you of note is the fact that nearly half of the world's population, which is about 3.6 billion people, live without a safe toilet. And globally, at least 2 million people still use drinking water so from contaminated sources. And about 700 children under the age of five years they die with diarrhea diseases linked to unsafe wash. Now, what are the consequences? Now, even though the Sustainable Development Goals has emphasized on closing gaps, but unfortunately, if we did not pay attention to wash, a lot of uh, Sustainable Development Goals are not going to be attained. And the worst one is the gender inequality. So women and children are going to be disproportionately affected, and especially the girl child. Up to date, an estimated 8% of maternal deaths are related to lack of wash in our healthcare facilities. And then the increased, if you do not have wash, there will be increased burden of healthcare associated infections, as well as um, microbial resistance. And then, as I said earlier, many of the sustainable development goals will not be attained. Now, in our, the next series of slides, we'll be looking at the results of a survey that we did in Cameroon in 2020 and in 2021. Uh, the first thing is the Cameroon health system actually is a, a decentralized health system with about 10 regional delegations, about 181 health districts, and over 4,500 uh, health facilities, which are public, uh, private, and the faith-based uh, facilities. And the health facility will range from specialized hospitals, uh, districts and regional hospitals, medicalized health centers. Those are health centers that have medical doctors. And then we have integrated health centers, which are more in the rural areas. And then we have what we call the health posts. Health posts are small facilities that are found in very remote communities and is usually run by the community under the technical supervi supervision of a health a, a provider. And presently, the health posts in Cameroon are mostly private facilities. They are not really uh, recognized by the government. And then in addition to that, we have private clinics, uh, which are found mostly in, uh, in urban areas. Um, the study we conducted in 2020 uh, included uh, 103 health facilities from 35 health districts in six, six out of the 10 regions. And it included 16 hospitals, 47 integrated health centers, and uh, 40 health posts. Now, the distribution of health facilities, majority of them were in the Northwest region. Now, this is because uh, the monitors, the people who did the assessment, we tried to assign a health facility that were closest to them uh, because we did not have enough funding. And therefore, since most of the monitors were found in the Northwest region, uh, more than 60% of the facilities were from the Northwest region. And then the rest were in the Adamawa Littoral West Center um, and the Southwest uh, regions. 
Now, according to the type of facilities, majority of them, about 46%, were integrated health centers. And as I mentioned earlier, integrated health centers are found mostly in, in, in rural communities. Then according to the hand hygiene framework, um, about only four of them were able to meet the advanced level. Advanced means that when you score the framework and then you summarize the score, the facility had uh, 376 uh, over 500 marks because the total framework is on 500 marks. So only four facilities had a mark that was about 376 or more. And then majority of the health facilities were under the basic level, meaning that they were under 126 marks to 250 over 500. Now, if you look at where the most facilities fall, this is already an indication that wash coverage in Cameroon is poor. Now, in terms of um, the different uh, wash and the uh, components, now on this graph, we have classified the facilities according to the different, uh, uh, the type of facility and their score on the different wash indicators. The blue bars, they represent hospitals. The gray bars, they represent integrated health centers. And then the green bars, they represent the hair posts. Now, if you look across, you will discover that the green bars are the least uh, uh, in, in terms of coverage. We mean that in terms of coverage, hair posts had the least coverage. In cleaning, they had only 23% um, of the health facility has sufficient wash uh, cleaning. And then in terms of hand hygiene, the coverage in terms of hand hygiene was only 31% meaning that only 31% of the facilities had adequate hand hygiene infrastructure. Then for healthcare waste, only 15%. Sanitation, 7%. Water, 26%. Uh, management, management means the leadership, about only 3%. Now, if you look at this, you will see that there is a very, very big problem. Now, if only three out of about uh, 40 facilities have sufficient waste management infrastructure, it therefore means that 37 do not have. Now, if you look even in terms of hospital, the maximum coverage that we have is about 68%, which is for water, meaning that we still have about 32% of the facilities that do not have sufficient water in terms of quality and quantity, meaning there is a very, very big problem as my core panelists already indicated. Now for toilets, these are some of the toilets that we found in some of the places that did not meet wash standard, meaning that they cannot be clean, they are not labeled, they are not separated according to gender and staff, and they are even fragile and can collapse at any time. Some of them are not even enclosed. And then if you look at this kind of toilet, you will discover that a woman will feel very uncomfortable. For men, they can try. But a woman will feel very uncomfortable to use this health facility as a result of the fact that they do not have good toilets. Now, this goes to emphasize the fact that up to date, we still have health facility that do not have toilet at all, or that have toilet that do not meet wash standards. And therefore, if you have this kind of a health facility, then you can imagine what will happen. Now, the next thing, we also specifically look at water, and this was in 2021. We assessed 71 facilities, and out of those 71 facilities, 25% had no water at all. And then out of those 25, up to 90% of them were health posts. Only 12% were health integrated health centers. Now, this was just in relation to whether there is even water. We did not even look at the quality of the water. If we had to go into the quality, many more facilities would have been considered not to have water. 
Now, even those facilities that have water, we discover that many of them, they always do not have water a certain period of the year or certain times of the day. The water was not continuous, it was not regular. And therefore, most of the facilities that even were considered to have water, I did not meet the, the wash uh, standard. Now, to conclude, this results point to us the fact that wash coverage remains poor in many countries, including Cameroon. I am sure it's the same thing in Nigeria. I am sure it's the same thing in Central African Republic. I am sure this results will reflect the same thing in many African countries. Now, the second thing we want to highlight here is that we need WASH to achieve multiple health interventions. Now, we've heard about universal health care, we've heard about sustainable development goals, and if we do not have WASH, all of these uh, global health interventions are not going to be achieved. Now, the third thing we also want to note is that there really cannot be any quality care without WASH. If you do not have wash, then there is no way you can deliver quality care. Then you will be talking about something else. And then the last thing I would like to highlight here is that we have a very serious need to prioritize wash at the level of the different health facilities with a special attention to integrated health centers as well as health posts where they exist. Now, these are some questions that we would like us to discuss if time permits. Now, why is it that, what is the situation of the wash uh, uh, in your facility, in your region, in your state? Now, this calls attention to the fact that we need to intentionally look out for the wash coverage in our facilities and in our regions. And then the, last, the second question I would like us to also look at, since 1978, when the primary health care was adopted and WASH was one of the components up to date, WASH coverage still remains low. What has been the cause, the cause or the causes? And then how can we improve WASH coverage in our health facilities, in our region, as well as in our countries? Thank you for your kind attention. Very much, Jacob. That is top proportion. Mm -hmm. I like the way you ended it, and we're going to come back to that after we take the last presentation. Because it seems we said primary health care 1978, alma matter declaration. How far have we gone? From your study, we can see that everything about the PSC are all low, the lowest level. So we should just note and then we discuss. We hope we have a robust discussion at the end. Now, the last but not the least presenter is one of us that is doing his advanced course at the College of Medicine University of Lagos. Uh, Mr. Benson Agu from the Alex Equeme University Teaching Hospital at Bakaliki, that's the eastern, eastern part of the country. He is going to share with us his improvement, IPC improvement that he's been able to do since he went back uh, from the courses. He started the course, he's doing his advance, but we want to see what is happening. And I'm looking forward to see the wash issue in a less equipment teaching hospital. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Dr. Shahanda, I can hear you. Okay, you have the floor so that we can have time to discuss. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahanda. Thank you for the opportunity. I thank, um, yes, I thank um, the College of Medicine. Uh, for giving me this opportunity. It's a very big one. And um, I must uh, say that uh, the two speakers have spoken well. And uh, in fact, the last speaker uh, made mention of so many things that are really affecting us as facility, as country, uh, and as a continent. So 
wash is a very important aspect of IPC. Okay, so I am going to present the case of um, Alice Equipment Federal Investing Teaching Hospital, uh, the improvement that we've been able to uh, do uh, since the institution of a uh, IPC program in Alice Equipment University Teaching, uh, Federal uh, Teaching Hospitals. The next slide, please. My name is Abu Benson Okoro. I am the focal person for Biology Center. Okay, so the outline, we are going to take the introduction. We are going to do the IPC program in Alice Equipment University Teaching Hospital before and the present condition. And we are going to be looking at the uh, going uh, forward and of course the conclusion. All right, Alice Equipment Federal University Teaching Hospital it's a large health facility with about 700 beds. It's more when you combine some of the isolation centers. It's a major um, uh, institution health facility from the former Federal Medical Center and the Ebony State University Teaching Hospital, a tertiary institution before now. Okay, so the major came uh after uh, due consideration from the states you know and uh, the federal government and they merged in 2011. it consists of uh, two sites we have the feta one and we have the feta two now why we had this um feta one feta two is just because of the major the former university is having a different site and the other university and the other hospital exists as independent hospital. So now in FETA 1, we have uh, the administrative block, we have the pediatric, we have uh, the obstetric and gynec department. Why in the FETA 2, we have the emergency complex, the biology centers, isolation, uh, COVID isolation, the medical department, surgical and also community medicine. We also run at a community annex, which is situated in one of the communities, and that is a Wesley community. Okay, the, the, the other facility which I've mentioned is the uh, biology center. The biology center is an independent, somehow, a research institution, okay, that house the Lassa Fever Center. And uh, uh, since 2008, we had a partner who is actually um, on ground, making things work in the facility, okay? So we're going to be discussing the wash as it's concerned our facility. Now, the organogram of IPC is, um, ranges from, from the highest authority to the least receiving end, which is the, the world uh, staff, healthcare workers. We have the CMD, we have the chairman of um, the IPC committee, who is representing as the focal person of uh, IPC in the, in the facility. We have the IPC committee proper, which cut across all discipline. Like we have the lab, laboratory scientists, we have um, the, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the environmentalists and all that. Then we have the IPC team, we have the link nurses, which are trained and we have also change agents in the, uh, in the facility. So and all this work together to actually ensure that IPC, uh, uh, IPC programs are being achieved in our facility. The IPC program before now was nothing to write home about, just like the uh, uh, presenters have said, you know, when we talk about uh, water, water was a very big issue because some part of a, a body and the, some part of our facility was very difficult to actually dig a borehole. And uh, for any reason, when we dig a borehole at uh, dry seasons, sometimes or most times we 
we we lack water in those wells. So, and that is a very big challenge. Okay, so also in training and the education, before now, we, you know, we don't have much of this education, much awareness about IPC and even the wash as uh, we are discussing here. No education, no training. So, you know, people just live by what they have seen or what they acquire from school. And that had actually endangered so many people. Even if um, some of us are reading from the news, you find out when we had Lhasa outbreak in 2018, in fact, it uh, actually took so many lives. The doctors, the nurses went, uh, you know, out of lack of IPC, which is linked to education and training. So the health uh, care waste also is not in isolation. It was poorly managed. In fact, everything is commingled, not until the institution of the IPC committee. Okay, the hand hygiene also was, uh, in fact, it was nothing to write home about. When you're talking about no water, there is no way you can talk about hand hygiene partially anyway, because we might classify hand hygiene uh, uh, in terms of hand washing and uh, also uh, uh, hand sanitizing. So environmental cleaning also was poor because of the same lack of water. The laundry and CSSD uh, practices was also very, very poor and the flow in the, um, in the laundry section or the CSSD section was very poor. You know, it is just one entrance, both uh, the uh, clean linen and the washed, the, uh, and also the dirty linen passing through the same uh, routes to enter and also exit. We must not also forget about the PEP. You know, it's, the protocol was not, uh, you know, it was not stated. It was not understood by health workers. You know, so, but as time continued to, uh, uh, you know, uh, come on, as soon as the, C, the, 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 the past CMD regime office and was able to uh, institute the IPC committee, things started coming up. It started sending some of us to training on infection prevention and control. And, uh, uh, you know, just like um, uh, Dr. Shoande introduced me as, you know, I, I have found myself to be part of the advanced uh, uh, students. So now I'm going to show a picture after here. You see the development we have been able to do. The training is tremendous. In fact, on our own, we have, we have a plan uh, in the committee. For the year, we have to train this number of um, staff. In a year, we have to train this number of trainers in a year. So it is incorporated in our plans and it is where we, we achieve it um, every uh, year. Then water is also, water has also uh, improved in, us, in our facility. Many boreholes have been dug around the facility, even when at dry season, we still have little problem. But however, the overhead tanks, which are situated in every part of the world, uh, we, we also um, uh, put water in them to support the activity of wash. Then the healthcare wastes are now desegregated as such especially in the isolation centers where um, we know it's infectious disease. So we also do segregation at the source. Uh, you have just yes. two, three minutes more so that we can have time to discuss. Okay. So, so hand hygiene, good. So also hand hygiene is also improved because there is water now. Then environmental cleaning, of course, is optimal because of availability of water. Laundry and the CSSD services and the flow 
is also improved. Let me see the next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So, in our way forward, we plan to consolidate the gain that we have had so far by also training and tra uh, training of trainers, which of course we have done one in um, January. We have also done one in March. The waste uh, management um, improvement is ongoing. It is only in the isolation centers that we have optimal waste management system. But we want to replicate the same thing in all the other parts of the hospital. Then hand hygiene, compliance, and antimicrobial stewardship and HAI surveillance are also ongoing in the facility. The next slide, please. Ah. Next slide. Okay, so I conclude by uh, that there's a substantial improvement in IPC practice since the insertion of the IPC programs in, uh, in AE footer. And there has also been a considerable support by the facility man management. And also, of course, the CMD has received a very good um, knowledge of IPC and is supporting IPC at all levels. So the program is also receiving acceptance by every health worker in our facility. Let me see the picture, sir. The pictures. The pictures, okay. So this is the molecular laboratory in the biology center. So you can see the hand washing and the waste management uh, container. That is how the place is organized. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, and this is our triage. The triage is beside the emergency uh, complex. So at the triage, that is the first point where the patient comes before he's sent to the, the main uh, uh, emergency unit. The, by the uh, left, you have the, the administrative complex. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yes. You can see the improvement we have done. We don't allow the waste litter everywhere. The waste is first um, uh, stored before it is moved to the waste, waste zone. And the waste zone is what you are seeing on the screen. We have the, um, the incinerator, we have the pits where the residue is also being uh, uh, finally disposed. So, and that is the emergency room. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Benson. That's uh, at least uh, we can see that. Now we want to discuss, I hope we've all noted. Can you please raise your hand if you want to talk? Uh, but I want us to go back to uh, Mr. Jacob, to Kwan Jacob's last a point for discussion. But if you have anything you've written down that you want to, can you please kindly raise your hand and let's have a divorce discussion. I have typed the major questions and ready in the chat box. Uh, we've spoken about the, uh, the start of the PSC provision for low to, uh, well, low to medium to low income countries. But continents is still poor on wash. We want to brainstorm on this. And uh, the first bullet says, what is the situation in your own facility? I know the facilities here cut across. Can we have somebody from the tertiary who is ready to share, to put up their hand, and just in a summary, give us what the situation is. We all know it is poor, but let's just, what is on ground? What is the baseline? And then we now talk about what do you hope your suggestion for improvement. So somebody from a tertiary facility who is on, can you please share the water situation in your facility, the sanitation, because the sanitation will lead to the hygiene. 
Mrs. Williams has given us a solid foundation, which is very good. Water provision, we all know it is a problem. So please, and I have a hand up. Uh, Jacob has shared the study in Cameroon, and I'm looking forward to when we have studies to share for Nigeria. But right now, tell us what is happening in your facility. That's the question that Jacob is asking, so that we can have a robust discussion. Over, I'm waiting for hands. Can you please raise your hands? Hello? Are we there? I know. Uh, everybody say, well done, Benson, well done, Jacob, well done, Mrs. Williams, yes. But you know, we want to know the situation. Since 1978, we are in 2022. Where are we still at this point? What are your suggestions to move from this poor report? What do you think should be done? We are all like ECS, but we need to move. We cannot remain here for another eight, ten years. Yes, suggestions for the people who are in the facilities. Please talk. We are waiting. Uh, Benson okay, has been so Mrs. Ayori, the Margaret. Can we have you? Mrs. Ayori, the Margaret, you have the floor. Mrs. Ayori, the Margaret. Otherwise, let's have Mabrensi just spoke. This is how you're ready. She's not coming there. Let's face it. Face it. What's what? Just what, take it together. You okay. Yes. Yes. Thank, yes. thank you. Thank you, Ma. Um, from uh, what Jacob shared, I think we cannot remain like this. And that is why the training is ongoing to actually increase the number of advocates uh, or um, advocacy in the facility. Now, um, I can suggest that if the facility managers are able to actually uh, buy into IPC uh, activities in all sets of every um, project, we should be able to incorporate all necessary and required wash uh, equipment and materials in such projects. And how do we do that? If at every point we want to start any project, the IPC are involved from the beginning, I think we can actually have a headway. That's my little contribution. Thank you very much. Mrs. Margaret is here now. Can we have your contribution? Please lower your hand, Pensy. Thank you. Mrs. Margaret, are you ready? It's not there anymore. We can't hear you. Ah, we can't hear. We can't hear you. Can you hear us? Can you unmute? We are muted. I think so. We can't hear her. Maybe we should turn, we can't hear you. How much one Um Emmanuel Kofu, I think he's from Cameroon. Emmanuel, your hand is up. Uh, then I will read what Jacob has written. Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you very much. For, yes, I don't know if you can hear me now. We can hear you. I can see. I can see you on that uh, table and uh, Jacob. Nice to yeah. meet you. I, I was invited by Jacob to this presentation. Thank you. I miss. I missed the first part of it, but I would love to share uh, our experience from from the the questions for discussion he raised, which are pertinent. Uh, I work with him and we, I will share from my own side where I'm supervising these days, which is a kind of a tertiary uh, unit where the wash situation, particularly water supply, is really an issue it, uh, where I've been working for the past three months in one of our towns in Mutengene. Water supply is intermittent, even though we have 
about three boreholes that are supposed to supply water into the unit. We still have serious issues with water supply to the extent that the upper floors of the, of the, of the story buildings, even to where the theater is, does not regularly, regularly have uh, water supply. Another thing that has been raised here, which is very crucial, which we need to discuss, is funding for, for water supply. Funding for water supply is really key because if we keep depending on foreign donors or some other person to come from somewhere to improve our water supply, then I think we are making a mistake. I see that we have opportunities within ourselves to galvanize and to raise funds within ourselves that will be sufficient enough to generate the water we need. But for some reason that I cannot explain, we have developed this culture of wanting someone else to come to our need for very basic things that we are able to do at grassroots. So if I may suggest, I say we need to begin to think so that we can put into our goals and budget annually how each facility will want to improve on the water supply that they have at the time and see how to progress from there. Because one of the major problems we have with water supply is preventive maintenance. We do not work on maintenance on time. We wait for things to get bad before we start running up and down. If we can do preventive maintenance, it is going to help us a big deal to stabilize uh, the water we have. For WASH, particularly in our experience, we realized that trainings and resolutions and strategies are good, but there is a problem with sustainability. Sustaining what has already been achieved is a challenge because it's like we are going to and fro. We think we have succeeded in this one. Before we know it, we are coming back to square one for something we think we had already done, which is not the way. If you see the way the Western world succeeds is they don't wait for things to get back before they improve on it. They improve on it as they are using it and look for ways to further improve on the functioning of what they have. But that is not a culture we have developed. There's this culture we have developed of always wanting a new thing, but not being able to maintain the old ones. Thank you, that is my contribution. Thank you very much, that's a very useful deliberation, and I just want to just chip in that especially at the PAC level, that is what we call community ownership, community participation. Are we thinking about that? Are we waiting for outsiders to come and uh, make water available for us? And when we have the water, do we manage the water well? Do we waste it? So are those are good for us. We don't want to just live here and then come back in another year and we're still on the same spot. We want to move. Just like Benson just showed us what he's been able to do. We want to leave this presentation and start thinking, what can I do so that we move from where we are? Uh, there are discussions in the chat box. Uh, I think uh, the last speaker has taught a lot of them that you need to budget for water. Do we have budget? We need to involve the management. We need to work in a team. We need stakeholders. You can't do it alone. We need the hospital engineer. We need the hospital engineer to work with us. But first, we must pay advocacy and make sure they see we all are seeing it as a problem. Because if, you don't, if they don't see it as a problem, then we're the same spot. Whether we are tertiary or secondary or PAC. So I have more hands raised. Uh, if you have spoken, Emmanuel, can you lower your hand? You just spoke. Um, is there a new hand up? Okay. Okay, so I think... Um, uh, from my hand is off. Yes, uh, is that Jacob? Yes, please. Yes, you can, you yeah. can, yeah, you can chip in. And Thank you. Like on. Everybody can contribute, even if you don't work in it. But we need to see, we don't want to depend on this is for. 1978 to 2002, we are here. What can we do? Nigeria, Cameroon, continent, what are our suggestions to move forward? That's the question. Over Thank you, Doctor. Yes. yes, my 
intervention is in three areas. Uh, I will talk about funding, then political will, and then the technician, this the experts, what each what role each one has to play. Uh, let me begin with um, funding. Now we need to orientate the mindset of the funders to prioritize projects that have watched as one of the components. You know, there's a lot of money that is going to uh, antimicrobial stewardship and other interventions, but WASH, which is an integral part of those uh, programs, is hardly even um, considered. I know this comes from the background that the funders and the people who are writing those projects, they did not know that IPC WASH play a central role in antimicrobial stewardship and other uh, uh, interventions. And therefore, we need to begin a campaign to sensitize people to know that both funders and people who are implementing projects to know that any project that has a component of wash in it should be prioritized because it will have a greater impact uh, to the community. Now, another aspect of funding is the local resources. For example, government funding to the health facilities. Uh, the Abuja Convention of 2000 stipulated that uh, countries should prioritize at least 15% of the budget of the state budget to health, but up to date, less than 30% of the contract have been able to attain that objective. And presently, as we speak, most of the country are below 6%. I know most of the time we will say that we don't have money. That is not true. We spend a lot of money on other things, which if we prioritize uh, healthcare and specifically wash, we may not have enough, but at least we will have sufficient funds to ensure that every health, uh, health facility uh, has basic wash. And then the third aspect of funding, which is something I want us to be reflecting about, on my picture, I put the football stars. It was very intentional. Now, these guys, they make a lot of money. They come from villages. If you go back, let me ask for example, if you go back to your coach's village, for example, or a toast village, Will they have water in their health facilities? You might find that they don't have, but it's not because they don't want to do, but it's because they don't know. Nobody has read their attention to the fact that that is a need that they need to meet. And so we need to go towards these people and call them to know that out of the much money they have, their communities beginning from their village, as well as the countries, they need part of that money in order to sustain uh, watch systems. And I just learned of recent that um, this guy from Senegal, uh, Sergio Mani, he has built a lot of schools and I think health facilities too. That's an example that most of those football stars can be able to emulate and then they will improve life of the people in their own communities. Now, the second intervention is about uh, political will. Now, a lot of things that we don't have is because the people who are involved in decision making, they don't have the will to do it. And part of it come because they don't know. And then the second part is because of bad, bad faith in general. And so we must hold them to tax. Let us hold our politician to tax to ensure that the basic uh, services that we need, they should be provided. And I know that we have money in Africa for every health facility to have basic wash. And then the last intervention is about the wash expert, IPC expert. Sometimes even we who are experts, we miss the point. We spend a lot of money on training, training. There is no use training somebody when the person does not have the infrastructure available. The training will just end up as nothing. So those of us who are responsible for designing projects, we should always look at the infrastructure first before we look at the, sub, the, the software, as um, my, my panelist said. So if you don't have the hardware, if you have the software, it is useless. So you have to have both in order to be able to improve. Thank you. Area about uh, training. Training is a means to an end. It is not an end in itself. We need to talk about infrastructure. We need to talk about supplies. Because if you have the knowledge and you don't have the supplies or the infrastructure, then we're wasting our time. 
So we need to look at IPC holistically. We need to involve all the partners. We need all the experts to build the environment. And of course, advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. We may not make it in a day. It all was not built in a day. But if you keep pushing, we will get there. Um, I don't know if there's any other hand up. Margaret, I already did. I don't know whether we can get her. Can you read Mrs. Williams? Thank you. I really like it. Yes, I hope yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to everything that Jacob said. I agree 110% with what he has said. Um, I think it's very important that we start to get creative about these things. You know, if we sit down and wait and say it's until government realizes and wakes up and decides to prioritize WASH, we have to be active if we're going to make the changes we want to see. And I think I love the example of the footballers because we know that these are the kind of people who have a connection to a community and they also have the resources mm -hmm. and and the leverage, the power to be able to do such. Another group of people is politicians. We should be putting positive pressure on our politicians at the local level. They have budget for you know, local projects in the community and they can as well target some of those funds and resources to the health sector, um, to the, for example, primary healthcare system in their constituency. It's very important that we, that we start putting pressure on people to do what is required. As we've said, access to clean water is a basic human right. And I think another thing that came to mind as he was speaking is the need to back up the advocacy we're doing with evidence. You know, it's one thing to go to someone and start shouting that clean water is a human right. We need it. It's important. We need it. But if you don't go with the statistics, with the data, with the evidence of why do we need it? What is the consequence if we don't get this thing? You know, those are the things that people can relate to and respond to. You have to meet them where they are when you're trying to do this kind of advocacy, because these are big challenges we're talking about. As you said, Dr. Shaw, and the room was not built in a day. We can't solve these things overnight. But certainly we can make progress if we are strategic in the way that we go about it. So um, because of time. Thank you very much. I think we've had some very robust discussions. And I'm sure this discussion will go even beyond this echo session. Because this is a problem that has been recurring. And we need to move our countries, we need to move our PAC, our health facilities, states, and uh, the country forward. Luckily, we are, and the, the, the politicians are asking for our votes. So we need to hold them accountable. We need to go and check what do we need. We need to give them some challenges. We don't just vote for them, and that is it. We need to give them, and they must come back and report back to us. Not just give us 5,000 naira and then you waste your vote. These are very things that are very, very basic and that can control the election and control in our communities. The footballers are there, the politicians are there. Even within the community, there should be community participation. There are rich business, businessmen in the community that can help. Have we identified them? Do we have our uh, village? Community Development Committee, we need to involve. We should be creative, we should look around. Government will do it. We know that the head budget should be 15%. I know most of them is less than 6% because they rather build roads that everybody will see. They will say, who will see water? Nobody will see water, but we need to educate them. We need to keep educating them. And that work is for you and me. And I hope we all live here today and take it as a challenge. That if I do my own little part in my own little corner, it will eventually add up. And then we will to make things better. I want to thank everybody that has made time. I know everybody is busy, so many things going on. Competing uh, events are going on, but for those that have created time to be here, I want to just ask you to please don't forget to fill the feedback. Feedback uh, is in the chat box. The link, can you give us your feedback for what is your takeaway? And what do you think you don't wear? What do you think we need to improve on? Uh, is another successful monthly NC Echo. Uh, as we look forward to next month, the last Thursday of next month, we're going to have, I think we're going to go deeper 
from cleaning and disinfection. And incidentally, we had something similar this morning. But then this wash is very, very vital. And I want to ask all of us here to please be able to think of something you've been able to do and maybe send us an email or send us a WhatsApp of what your ideas are so that together we can put it together and move our health facility forward, our state and our continent as a whole. So please give us your feedback. I want to thank our brilliant facilitators for the thought-provoking presentation they've given us, that because this is something that is very basic, it's very basic, but still very, very vital. I want to say thank you very much for your time, for sharing your expertise with us, and then making us have a robust discussion. Like I said, the discussion is still ongoing. It's not something that can finish today. It will, it will get there. I want to believe we'll get there. And if the Bible says when two or three together and gather together, we will move mountains. Let's have that belief together and we will to do it. So please feel they go to the chat box and do, your, do our feedback for our partners. And then please, these presentations we're going to uh, have, we want you to go back and share it. This message has to be multiplied. We want a multiplier effect. We shouldn't just remain with you. If you share with one, two, three, four, and those one, two, three, four, five, share with another one, two, three, four, five. I'm sure we need to share this information. This is very, very important. And I'm sure with this, I want to say thank you all very much as you do the attendance at the, 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 the attendance. As you 